Hello, students, and welcome to class. Today, we are going to begin our next major religion of China. And our next major religion of China is Buddhism. All right. Give us one second to get our little technical problems, but that happens sometimes. And when we talk about religions of China, we are remembering that while these divisions such as Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, they're often blurred. Often one will not identify with either of these, but maybe engage in traditions associated with all three of them. All right, let's just take a look at a World Buddhist Forum that is taking place in a city in China. We're going to meet some Buddhists from all over the world. And I apologize, the sound quality is not so great for some of these. A mix of beliefs, spirituality, and religious elements, Buddhism has defined Chinese culture since the Han Dynasty. The faith developed alongside Taoism over the centuries, with the Mahayana branch the prominent form of what is known as Chinese Buddhism. But what does it mean now, and how does it connect with Chinese society and mankind? Of course, this is a great country they can't separate from the Buddhism. This country is the China, is the country, their civilization enriched by Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, these three religions. And even for those who have come to China to pursue other endeavors, Buddhism is finding its way. Shaolin Temple in China to practice Kung Fu. The Kung Fu and the Buddhism is the same. That's uh, sometimes I learn in the Buddhist philosophy, I like, I think it's good. The significance of this global gathering is that those from the religious field can come together and address Buddhism and its path going forward. And for a country like China, home to some 240 million Buddhist followers, 20,000 Buddhist temples, this platform here is vital to preserving its traditions and its spirituality. Yet one of the bigger questions that remains how is Buddhism being practiced, and what's next for the faith? No, good future, actually. I think say, it's a good future because of the, our Lord Buddha's teaching. Already, if they develop the science, uh, Lord Buddha is saying also uh, uh, be a truth, uh, not uh, uh, false things. All these things, if the uh, science is uh, developed, then uh, we can see the uh, science through uh, Buddhism also. I think Buddhism in, in China will have a good future uh, because more and more people, they just understand, they know the Buddhism um, and uh, they uh, believe in the Buddhism and uh, maybe just uh, become the practitioner of Buddhism. For an ancient creed that many may assume to have declined over the centuries, Buddhism is alive and well. And for these monks here, celebrating yet another gathering of philosophical exchanges, there's really no reason to not be smiling. Omar Khan, CGTN, Putian City. Okay, so we took a little sample of what, a little, little snapshot of Buddhism in China. And let's learn a little bit. Today's lecture is going to be really introducing us to the basics of Buddhism, especially Buddhism in India. But wait a minute. Isn't this a religion that's of China class? This is a religion of China class. Why am I going to talk about India? Well, we're going to meet our first major religion that will enter the Chinese cultural context from the outside, from the Indian subcontinent, the part of the world that is referred to as South Asia. Buddhism will enter the part of the world that we call East Asia. That's where you find China. 
And then from China, it'll go to Japan and Korea. So, but today's, and we're gonna learn more about that, the history of Buddhism and the types of Buddhism we find in China in our next lecture. But today is just kind of a basic introduction. But let's, let's review a little bit about our context. So we've been focusing on the Yellow River Valley civilization in this class, the Yellow River Valley civilization as the place where cultures and dynasties and ideas flourish in this context of dynasties and changing cultures, we learned about Confucianism, we learned about Taoism, and we learned about the religion of the common folk, the folk religion, the religion of oral traditions, of local customs. Now, one of the things about China that we've also learned is that throughout its history, history has been important writing about, thinking about, talking about the past. And the past views this idea of a golden age. It's the, the three sovereigns followed by the five emperors, the first supposed dynasty created by Yu the Great, the Xia dynasty. Confucius would look to figures like the Duke of Zhou, the early Zhou dynasty where this really, this area is an area of culture with a long-standing great history. But one of the themes that we also find in Chinese history writings is the fear that barbarians, those who are outside the civilization will invade and impose their barbaric ways. And thus we saw things like the building of the Great Wall of China to protect the really rich history and culture of this area. But when empires fall, when the, the dynasties begin to collapse, people begin to question, well, why is this happening? And when you see family, friends, and your neighbors dying during wars or famines, there's a sense of maybe, hey, what's going on? We need to change course. During the fall, during, during, during a period, I don't wanna say at the absolute fall, but during a period of chaos, periods of strife of the Han era, a new religion will enter China, will enter East Asia from South Asia, and that is Buddhism. Buddhism will make certain promises like the idea that um, one can escape suffering once and for all. In Buddhism will also introduce a new institution, the institution of monasticism. So a community, a society of monks and nuns in defined in part by the fact that these monks and nuns are taking vows of celibacy and giving up family ties. This will be one of the critiques by certain groups like the Confucians who will say that oh, they're giving up the family. This, that's, this goes against our ancient you know, norms and etiquettes, our, our li. This cannot be a virtuous system. Buddhism will introduce new practices like meditation. Meditation will, will and, and we'll find kind of a cousin tradition that's willing to, I don't, I'm reluctant to call it a cousin tradition, but through Taoism, Buddhism will find a dialogue, a kind of a, someone to enter into dialogue with, a traditions to be in conversation and share ideas with. Taoism will incorporate certain elements of Buddhist ritual, certain elements of Buddhist meditation practices and ideas of monasticism. And through Taoism, Buddhism will find ways of taking their ancient scriptures, which are written in Sanskrit or Pali, one of the ancient Indic languages, and, and finding a language to use to communicate in China and translate those scriptures. So that brings us to our next thing is that Buddhism will introduce new religious scriptures from the outside, translated into local languages. 
Right, and we're here in really around the sixth century before Common Era in the Indian subcontinent in the area of South Asia is a tradition of Buddhism. So Buddhism is very vast. There's many, many traditions within Buddhism, Mahayana, Theravada, Pure Lands, uh, Vajrayana. One of the things that all of the different schools of Buddhism will have in common is this idea of the three jewels. The jewels are metaphors for things that are just extremely precious and, and said to be the most precious things in the world. These are the Buddha. A Buddha is an enlightened being, a being who has freed their mind from all negative thoughts and emotions and has perfect love and perfect wisdom and a compassion for all beings. The Buddhas, their primary activities is they teach. The teachings of the Buddha are called the Dharma. The Dharma are found in the scriptures, which are said to have been preserved by the Buddha's disciples, mostly orally for much of its history. The sutras contain the teachings of the Buddha and the teachings of the Buddha are geared towards guiding individuals out of suffering. Buddhism also will have at its institutional core, the main community, a community of monks and nuns, and this is called the Sangha. So these three, met in this, these are jewels, but metaphorically speaking, they're jewels. And the most common prayer one finds is, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, and I take refuge in the Sangha. This prayer will be said in different languages, but Buddhists throughout Asia, throughout the history of Buddhism, have been reciting this prayer through, in some language, in some context or the other. This is an artistic depiction of the Buddha. This is more of a South Asian depiction. Seated under the peepal tree, a very sacred tree, sometimes called the Bodhi tree, and artistic depictions of the Buddha will often vary from place to place. And we'll look at some Chinese artistic depictions next week. So the Buddha, didn't, the Buddha, the historical figure around the sixth or fifth century BCE comes out of really this region of the Indian subcontinent. And who is this figure? Well, the name is Shakyamuni, the sage of a certain tribe called the Shakya. Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha Gautama is the, the individual who becomes the Buddha. And what does it mean to become the Buddha? To become the Buddha means to become an enlightened one. Now, in a separate YouTube link that I'm going to include in the same module, you'll see a little bit of a, a short um, depiction of the life of the Buddha. The Buddha, this is an enlightened being seen here, was concerned about escaping this. What in the world is this? This is an artistic depiction of the universe of Buddhism. Rather, the universe that we live in that is said to be designed in a way that creates nonstop perpetual suffering. This cycle of suffering, we use the term samsara. According to Buddhism, all beings, so long as they're not enlightened like the Buddha, are going to undergo great suffering. Why? because of their actions. Their actions, which are good or bad or neutral, create conditions that keep one trapped in a cycle of suffering. And the actions, their intentions and their results, we call that karma. 
Um, I go more into the Buddhism. I teach, I teach courses on Buddhism, but just briefly, the Buddhist universe is a universe where one is reincarnated. One is born again and again in these cycles of reincarnation in one of six realms, a human realm, a godly realm, but gods in Buddhism, unlike gods in some other religions, are mortal beings that eventually die. You have a, 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 a demigod realm. These are like, these are also gods, but not as quite as powerful. You have an animal realm, a realm of hells. The hells in Buddhism, unlike other religions, there's a finite amount of period that any being will be born into a hell. They will eventually die and be reborn somewhere else. And then you have a hungry ghost realm. There is no order that one is born into these realms. It's all going to be based on contingent upon one's karma, the actions that one's performed in one life and in previous lives. The Buddhism, in short, has, and this is my very, very short, short introduction to Buddhism. I give a much more expanded courses on this. There is an assumption that the Buddha taught. And that is if you can control your emotions. So if you control the emotions that we that, that govern us, that afflict us, through that, we can come to control our minds. And if we control our minds, we control our emotions, we can then gain control over our karma. And then we can escape suffering. And why is that? In Buddhism, all suffering is ultimately a mental state that is self-induced. So transforming the mind is the key to overcoming suffering and escaping this wheel. At the center of this wheel are what it's called, so the center right here, the three poisons. Buddhism's ultimate goal is to eliminate the three poisons, which are symbolized by three animals. We have a pig, a snake, and a rooster. These are called, these are the three poisons. The pig represents ignorance. The snake represents anger or hatred, devesha. And the rooster or bird, this represents greed or desire. It is these forces that create karma and fuel this endless cycle of rebirth. So the key beliefs, and these beliefs will find their way from the Indic religious context and find ways, especially using Taoism, turning to Taoism for metaphors and for languages, find a way of art, finding articulation in the Chinese religious context. So these are suffering, karma, that are actions, good, bad, or neutral, will inevitably you know, create consequences that we will have to bear. So what goes around comes around. Nirvana. Nirvana is, it's difficult to say what nirvana is. It's often described in the negative, what it's not. Not negative as it's a negative thing, but it's what it's not. So it's not suffering, it's not old age, it's not sickness, it's not disease. Nirvana is said to be an ultimate state of peace. And this is one of the ideas that Buddhism will introduce in the, chi in, in the Chinese cultural world is that there's some kind of happily ever after afterlife. There is some ultimate freedom. And this will be something that some would find very appealing. There is a way. Buddhism sometimes will adopt this language of the Tao, the way, but they'll say that the Tao, the way is the Dharma. At least that will be the language used when Buddhism starts to find articulation in the Chinese cultural context. The way, here it's the Dharma, consists of three main things. Number one is morality. Number two, which is, which 
This, again, we find some perhaps affinity with Confucianism. So living a moral lifestyle, meditation. And we saw meditation with Taoism, and that's because Taoism and Buddhism are very much in combination in, in, in conversation with each other. The Taoist ideal of Wu Wei, for example, of non-actions, the Buddhists might say, oh, that's meditating. Non-action, yeah, that's we, we practice Wu Wei through meditation. Harmonizing with an ultimate reality that's beyond word. So the Tao that can be spoken of is not the eternal Tao. This emphasis on wisdom is the key to obtaining nirvana. Buddhism as it enters China will have to figure out how to articulate these ideas in a brand new cultural context. And again, often it's gonna be using ideals from Taoism to help do, find a way to do so. The key institutions. So, in short, and you'll see more on the life of the Buddha in a separate link that I'm going to be attaching in this week's module. The Buddha was a prince named Siddhartha who gave up the royal life. Now think about China, where this idea of the mandate of heaven, that heaven ordains rulers who are to look after the people, where you have government and bureaucracy as a way of describing the pantheon and different deities. So to give up a position very, very high in the hierarchy, that's a big deal. And that's a big idea that people are like, whoa. So Siddhartha gives up being a prince, goes into the forest where he through, finds the Dharma the path to finding, to achieving nirvana. Those who followed him by also giving up society, and this will be one of the critiques of the Confucians, is like, what are you doing? It's this family ties, that's the key of who we are. That's what makes us the, the foundation of a heavenly society. Well, Buddhism is gonna introduce institutions that, that would give up the world, at least, at least in theory. And this institution is the Sangha. So this is a community of monks and nuns. The monks and nuns, however, will have close ties to dynastic rulers. And we'll look more about, look, look at that next class. And however, at times, certain rulers would see this religion of Buddhism as a foreign threat, a religion of barbarians. For example, in the Tang dynasty, one of the rulers would have these scriptures of Buddhism burned. All right, but speaking of those scriptures, the Sangha will preserve the Buddhist scriptures. The Sangha will find, will sometimes send scholars to India in the early history of Buddhism in China to study the scriptures and find ways of translating this very, very vast volume of scriptures into the Chinese language. And this is a theme we find throughout all of Buddhism in Asia is that monks and nuns are a field of merit by those who are not monks and nuns, those who are laymen and laywomen who give to the monks and nuns, this produces and creates good karma. All right, so this again, we're gonna continue this next week. We're looking at Buddhism as it goes from India to China. Today we focus primarily on some key foundational ideas of Indian Buddhism that will be transplanted through various means and adapted to the cultures and traditions and historical circumstances of, in China. And again, Buddhism will bring monasticism, new scriptures from India, and a plethora of new deities um, such as enlightened beings or Buddhas, bodhisattvas, and we'll meet some of them next week. There will be clashes and dialogues, often at odds with Confucianism, especially this idea of giving up society, of renouncing the world. There will be some affinities with Taoism. Taoism and Buddhism will be in dialogue and borrow ideas from each other and language. 
For example, Wu Wei from Taoism, we learned about that earlier in the semester. This will be a language used to describe meditation practices in Buddhism. And Buddhism will flourish during periods of conflict and turmoil in that it becomes seen as a religion that promises some kind of ultimate salvation, some ultimate freedom from the suffering and strife that individuals are facing in the world through the promise of this state of nirvana. It will find some challenges finding a foothold in the political system, as we're going to read about this week. And Buddhism will have to figure out, well, how can we convince political rulers to support us? Because often when a new religion enters, at the very least, those in power have to let it, you know, leave it alone and let it do, let it kind of spread and flourish, not use the army to suppress it. Well, Buddhism will actually introduce a new notion of kingship, this idea of a humane king, a Dharma king. And we're going to look at some passages from one of the scriptures on Buddhism and kingship in China next week. And finally, so next lecture, Buddhism in the imperial contexts of China. We're going to look at the major traditions of Chinese Buddhism, such as Chan and Pure Land. We're going to look at snippets from different Buddhist scriptures, and then we're going to meet more holy beings. We're going to meet some of the Buddhist deities and holy beings that become important in China. Okay, so that is our basic introduction to Buddhism. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude today's lecture, but please do stay safe. Stay well and stay 